I hope that uh, Mr. Goldberg is impressed with our democracy in action. as I'm sure he will be with uh, the campus and meeting many of you uh, in the short time that he can be here. I told him, as I told you earlier, that we wanted to invite an architect uh, sometime ago and that the possibility of being named the site for the state of Indiana's College of Architecture added a new dimension to our notions about his talk. I told him that if he wanted to say anything about architectural education he might, uh, but uh, I hope I've left it open uh, wide for him to speak of the things that are closest to his heart. As I talked with him briefly and uh, looked at his record, I find uh, the record to be both fascinating and awe-inspiring. Perhaps some of you know the little quotation from Lillian Smith where she says, an artist has but one song, no matter how many productions, how many creations the artist makes, he's really reworking that same song. I don't find this to be true in uh, Mr. Goldberg's case, for it seems to me from his record that he's gone from one area of invention and, and mastery to another larger, more complex uh, more important. He's a native of Chicago, studied at Harvard and at the Bauhaus in Germany, the what used to be uh, Armour Institute, now Illinois Institute of Technology. He was a student of uh, the famous Mies van der Rohe. Until about 1940, most of his work was in domestic architecture although he was beginning to do some very interesting things in uh, engineering design. One of the things that uh, was an early interest of his was low-cost housing. And if you saw the piece in the Sunday paper, you know that uh, one of his first projects in building low-cost housing uh, had this work done in Anderson, Indiana. In 1942, uh, working for the government, he built a whole community of uh, low-cost houses out in Maryland. During the war, he developed a number of engineering techniques which uh, made it easier for people to load shells, to move guns about, uh, and also uh, invented a mobile penicillin laboratory. Architects and engineers and designers do different things. But I was quite impressed, uh, as I'm sure you will be, to know that, among other things, he's engineered and designed the bathroom. <laughs> and this in itself isn't so much, but to have this bathroom selected and placed on permanent display at the Walker Art Institute at uh, Minneapolis is really something. <laughs> <laughs> to demonstrate the catholicity of his uh, interest, uh, he's also designed and had constructed railroad cars, met metal and uh, wood furniture, and uh, a number of other things. I'm sure that I just guess from the record that one of the things that interests him uh, very much at the present time is, is city planning. He did a design for city planning in the Calumet area as far back as 1950. His design for an apartment project in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, uh, received a national award in the year 1954. And his Drexel <coughs> Town and Garden apartment area received the award of the American Institute of Architects in 1958. His uh, work has taken him into the refurbishing of theaters. He has a design for a complete uh, marine center at West Palm Beach, which I uh, understand goes under construction this fall. He's designing an entire community in Mobile Bay. And in Chicago, uh, he's developed the Astor Towers. And I expect most of you have either seen Marina Towers or have read about it or in a recent Life magazine saw a picture of the Twin Towers, which uh, beckon one to the five-unit complex uh, there in Chicago. Mr. Goldberg has also been a writer, uh, 
a contributor to Architectural Forum. His engineering ideas are uh, certainly interesting and in sound like innovations to me. Last night he was talking about a, a building that's heated entirely by an electric light bulb. Uh, we might uh, save some of our steam if we could adopt a, a notion like be more comfortable probably too. I'm quite excited about the uh, remarks that uh, Mr. Goldberg is going to make to us today and I introduce him to you as a home builder, a city planner, an engineering designer, an author, a speaker, a many faceted artist, an architect. Mr. Goldberg. Thank you, Dean Burkhart. Uh, I hope I am here today as an architect and not as a speaker. I uh, hope that the work that we will be talking about today and the buildings that I will be showing you today, although very personal in their presentation and certainly my interest in them, will in a measure speak those things that uh, somehow the artist always has a considerable difficulty in making clear uh, frequently, even to himself. In talking to you of, as an architect, I find it necessary to find the place of the architect in society because his place has changed, certainly, over the past 2,000 years in several ways. And today he has a rather unique function, historically speaking. So I would like to tell you at least how the architect in the full bloom of his self-consciousness sees himself. Um, I would like to describe to you that society which I believe many of us see, many of us architects see around us and for which we are working. And then I would like to show you graphically and specifically the things which we do for that society as a kind of outgrowth of the background of these other two factors. The function of the architect in society has changed remarkably from the great days in which Vitruvius found himself through the Middle Ages when the architect became a stonemason, a Freemason, into today's society when the architect has emerged partially as an artist, partially as a social thinker philosopher, planner, economist. Vitruvius suggested that the architect should know more about painting than the painter, more about medicine than the doctor, more about law than the lawyer, more about ruling than the ruler. You can see how burdened he felt himself. <laughs> But it's simply because the architect is depended upon by those various people acting in society to say for them all that is known by them and as well as it can be said by the art of building. When we build for the doctor, we are speaking for the doctor as an architect in a large sense. And when we build for the ruler, we are speaking for the king acting as an architect. And many of them, of course, did. Many of the ecclesiasticals in the Middle Ages gave wonderful directions to their master masons. I remember uh, one direction that was given in Seville in the 14th century, which was to build a a temple to the glory of God that would be so great and so magnificent that men would think us mad even to have attempted it. 
Now this is this is an order of a client to an architect, but it's the order of a client who really wanted to be an architect himself. And so the role of the architect has progressed uh, from the participation in his society as all things to all men or speaking for them through the period of the Middle Ages when he became a kind of super craftsman and into a kind of uh, high fashionable intellectualism which prevailed in about the 18th or 19th century when the architect was a gentleman artist who pointed with his stick and said cut this here uh, he was instinctively uh, presumed to know the great fine art of building and this of course degenerated largely into a type of activity which uh, had fine lines and a fine style and where the building itself was separated uh, from the craft of the builder. The gentleman architect became so exquisitely the artist that he no longer knew how to build the building he was drawing. Today the picture has changed substantially I think that in coming to you as architect, I come to you as engineer, I come to you as a man who uh, spends at least half his life worrying about how water runs in buildings and how we keep it out of buildings, uh, how we get electricity in buildings, how we keep it out of buildings, uh, how we make our buildings function, how we build them and yet how out of all of this engineering we build a kind of um, aesthetic whole and an entity which has an expression of humanity which has an expression of soul which has an expression of beauty we're no longer afraid to use those words anymore after our 19th century functional days uh, and so the architect comes to you today as both an artist and an engineer if indeed those two things ever should have been separated. The society into which we come I think today it is impossible to describe our society without describing it as a kind of urban society. Uh, there was recently a meeting as recently as about three weeks ago it was one of President Johnson's meetings wherein he had a committee to determine the urban patterns of the United States how was the United States going to uh, become a country of the future and I that the committee decided in its infinite wisdom that about 75 or 80 percent of the United States in the very near future would be housed in about five cities in the United States. Now it's true that one of these cities extends from Boston to Washington. Uh, I think Pittsburgh survived in this planning. Chicago survived and there were two other cities. Uh, I believe San Francisco and of course Los Angeles. <coughs> but uh, we have become a society of city-states. This is not the first time this has happened in the world. As a matter of fact, in the 14th century in Europe, it was just a, a touch-and-go matter as to whether the entire Western civilization would be administered by city-states. And it was only by the efforts of the uh, feudal interests that the cities were taken away from the bourgeoisie and put back into a kind of uh, nationalism. In the United States we have had a resistance of course to cities. We have had a kind of Jeffersonian attitude toward the urban man which uh, in effect stated that all things that came from cities were evil and that all things that came from the country were good 
Uh, today we sit here as a, <clears throat> as a uh, congregation, as a community, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, define this, define this concept. We come together as a group of people with a common interest, uh, exchanging ideas, exchanging the best things of civilization, and we once again uh, <clears throat> restore the confidence in Aristotle's remark that the city is where one comes to lead the good life. Certainly it is the only place where in today's specialization one can have enough leisure to do the thinking and the creative processes which come from specialization. <clears throat> the farmer with his struggle for survival I suspect has very little time to sit down and contemplate his navel under a bow tree. Sorry for this urban cough of mine. <laughs> But we have not only evolved a city plan as a way of living, but we have come through an age, uh, a rather painful age, emerged from a 19th century period in which Freud took the soul of man away from religion, Darwin took the evolution of man away from God and Marx took the government of man away from the individual. I think this 19th century age of functionalism, of pragmatism, of mechanism has finally been left behind us. So that in looking at our cities today, we are not only looking at cities as a place where men come together in order to lead the good life, but we are looking at a new statement of mankind, a new faith in mankind. I think that if we look back on the words which we have just finished using, words such as functionalism and practicality and utility and mass production. Those words were shaped to a world of science by which the 19th century knew the world. But in contrast, in our new world, one of the first of the new words that were used in art appraisal was a simple word such as dada and now we have come beyond that and we find that there are words like surrealism we use words like abstract and we use words like other abstract words like decadent and dissolute and indeterminate we are using a new and different kind of word to describe a new and different kind of value for the men in these cities we're not afraid today to talk about God, and we aren't afraid today to talk about beauty, and we aren't afraid today to talk about humanity and humanism, and those values which I think back in the 20s we were too tough and cool to discuss. So that we are not only talking about a new community, but we're talking about a new man. I want to remind you that as recently as 1930, Frank Lloyd Wright called for the plowing under of New York City. This is a very recent change that we are describing now in our new urbanism. Uh, you have here in Indiana a rather remarkable writer, uh, Herbert Muller, I think at the University of, Al uh, of Indiana, uh, who said in one of his recent books 
that the city is the first clear sign of civilization. In the city, the economic surplus is collected and managed or squandered, and energy is further stimulated by close association, by division of labor, and by the pursuit of more wealth. These distinctive achievements of civilization are real gains, real goods. Only in a civilized society can man contemplate his inability to live on bread alone and dream of better ways of living. The material surplus provides the leisure of cultivating spiritual interests. The city is the main center of creative activity, the spiritual as well as the commercial and political capital. The self-conscious individual at his best is the glory of civilization. So this is the man we are talking about. We are talking about a man finding himself again. We are talking about a self-conscious man. We are talking about the individual and the expression of the individual. I think those of you who are involved in philosophical research use today the words existentialism as being a description of, a, of an attitude of the individual toward the society around him. And this, of course, is quite, quite in contrast to the society that we have come through, the Broadacre City of Frank Lloyd Wright, the mass city of, of Marx, the, the division of men into pieces which in truth never existed, the production man, the, the home man, the recreation man, the education man. And this today becomes a kind of nonsense because we realize that what we are trying to do is put ourselves back together as whole people and work for ourselves as whole people and create for ourselves as total people. So today when we build and to talk about designing for our society, when we build, we build not for the mass man, not these great factories for storing people five or ten miles away from factories where they work and five or ten miles away from factories where they are educated and five or ten miles away from factories where they go out and play vigorously and then go home and repeat the whole process over again. But we are building much rather for the individual within a mass society. That we have a mass society is without question. That the automobile is here to stay in all of its glory is without question. Uh, that we must enjoy the benefits of a mass building technique in order to fit within the framework of an economy which is certainly in the process of change, but that we need all of the advantages of mass construction and uh, mass environment is without question. But within this mass environment, we are attempting to reestablish the individual, to reestablish the glory of the, of the one flower in a field of daisies to look at the one person and his problems as if he were the only man in the universe acting within a system of other universes. We build today for that individual, but we build today not for the individual cut up in his component parts as the Marxians or the functionalists would have us, but we build today rather for communities, and we build today rather for communities of ideas. I go back to, again, to the 14th century, to Venice, to Venice which was put together as a city made of congeries of little cities, each island, an island of munitions, an island of glass, an island of cemeteries, an island of government, which finally became a city called Venice. And it is this community which we are talking about. 
but a community which is made up of zoning by communities. People are always horrified when I describe to them the fact that they can gather together because they have a common interest. And invariably, those groups who are most horrified are those groups who are brought together by common interest. For example, we are here today because we are basically a university group. And yet within that university group, I am sure that you find your own uh, great exchanges of ideas, your stimulation from each other's uh, conversations and work. And the stultification does not come from uh, forming a community. Stultification, when it comes, comes certainly from within side. But it is these communities of ideas, these communities of interest, which I am confident once again will form the nuclei for what we simply describe as neighborhoods, or what on a more complex basis we can call communities, or finally in its larger totality we can call cities. And whether these are university cities or whether these are great cities such as New York or Chicago, these are nevertheless the larger aspect of living together. We build today for this kind of total environment. We build for shelter, we build for work, we build for recreation and health, we build for a very self-conscious culture, and we build for a new type of thing which has come into our economy uh, at a very democratic level. We build for leisure. We build for a positive expression of leisure, which of course is a great and new force in our society. But our building is invariably for all of these things. We no longer are able just to build shelter. We are no longer able just to build a community house for a university without thinking of these other aspects of activity. We are no longer able to build just a hospital without thinking of the effect of total care and health for the community. We are no longer able to build business houses without thinking of traffic patterns, living patterns, recreational patterns for a working community that uh, goes to work five days a week for seven hours a day and wonders what else to do with the rest of its time. We are building for a total man in a total environment. This is the society which I believe the architect sees himself to be a functionary of. This is the man for which the architect is designing and working. And of course, in describing all of this, I am not isolating the architect from this. I am saying that the architect today is very much the urbanized man in its greater concept. The architect is very much a vital and working part of this community of man, and the architect certainly is the artist who intuitively attempts to express these things which I have been describing to you sometimes before the society in which he lives is conscious of these forces. I don't mean by this that we are a group of uh, self-conscious philosophers sitting down with a pencil and saying, now, what society am I working for? Uh, this is not the creative act. But the society in which we work somehow seeps into our innards, and it is uh, these uh, kinds of, of uh, emotions which I am describing to you, these creative emotions which I am describing to you today. It's, it's rather a painful process for me to uh, reach inside and try to evoke these things which are so much a part of the uh, daily drawing and the daily line. I think having described all of this, I would like very much to show you the actual physical application of these uh, ideas. What happens when you put these ideas on paper and how the shapes of the buildings change and how the shapes of the 
environments change. Could we have the slides, please? <coughs> Can this be disconnected or travel with me? Oh, the mic? Yes. Uh, well, does this work? No, but you won't have well, any, you won't have any power. Right. Can you can you hear me if I speak a little louder? These are two 14th century rose windows. And I came upon these rose windows because of my, my own work. Uh, they were so related to Marina City, I found them a couple years ago. Marina City was designed in 1959. And uh, I found these rose windows which were built in the same church in the same town of France about 75 years apart, one replacing the other. Uh, I found this to be so reflective of the progression of our own ideas and my own work that I was uh, compelled to, to uh, show them to you. This is the earlier rose window over here, which is, as you can see, a series of petals attached to a, uh, a centripetal core. Uh, the uh, or centripetal core rather the, the, the core is the attractive element here and this of course comes out of the, uh, the, the solid kind of uh, 13th, 12th and 13th century church thinking the, uh, the, the uh, hard ecclesiastical philosophical concept to which mm -hmm. the peripheral ideas were attached. And I want you to realize that in my own tradition of education, my own, uh, my own sequence of uh, development in my work, I too have come out of a uh, 19th century functionalism as expressed in post and beam construction. And now we are somewhat beyond that post and beam construction. We are working in more indeterminate uh, elements uh, elements which actually we, we no longer can engineer because we are beyond the positive engineering which was the outgrowth of the 19th century uh, positive architectural system. In this later rose window you will see that simply by the convolutions of these larger forms they have uh, created a, a kind of core but by inference, tangentially and that what here was concentrated toward a hard center, here becomes a rather explosive, uh, centrifugal uh, kind of idea. And I think that I will show you quite the same thing, quite accurately described in our own architectural evolution. But here you find uh, this, this is not unique. All we are doing is uh, restating uh, man's own intellectual development of another century. Next slide, please. This is the foundation of Marina City. Uh, this was a uh, this is a kind of abstraction uh, of a photograph, but it actually is a photograph in origin, uh, showing you the. Uh, 14th century early core of Marina City and showing you what will later become petals attached to this core. Uh, next slide, please. This is the superstructure of Marina City, which of course now relates quite <coughs> accurately to that early 14th century rose window. And here you again have the core, which rises 600 feet as a separate concrete shell and then you have these petals which attach themselves to this core which becomes of course our central idea. Sure, please. Sounds good.
2019 century science, which were. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. Now, this is the abstraction of Marina City. Uh, I showed you the balcony before, and now this is the the thing in its rather abstract form. I'm quite sure that some of the uh, fathers of of uh, Middle France would have regarded this as quite an acceptable rose window. Uh, next slide, please. Now this is later work, uh, and this again came to us and we were working with these forms uh, before the discovery of these rose windows, which I've only used to illustrate this, but you can see that what we have suddenly done, instead of having a solid core, is to take a great continuous concrete shell and just by convolution created not only our structure, but we have created, by creating the structure, we have also created the space within the structure. And we could no more divorce the space from the structure than, than uh, I mean, we, we, we would just have to make a, a total new building in order to, to change these shapes. True, we can widen them, we can narrow them, we can put more convolutions in, but the, the logic, the, the inspiration of the system makes space and form one. Now, this, of course, was not necessarily true of the 14th century, uh, which was rather an applied design, but, uh, and this becomes a rather unique thing in the 20th century, where we get into a thing called structo-aesthetics, where the engineering and the design, the aesthetics, are all so in irretrievably intertwined that you no longer can divorce one from the other. Next slide, please. <coughs> now this is a different expression of the same kind of convolution. The first one, the earlier one, was an attempt to see whether uh, it would become uh, acceptable for an apartment building. Uh, this is to see whether uh, the same form could be expressed as an office building. And I will show you this building in a rather uh, extensive model form in a movie in just a moment to show you how not only is this an office building, but how the very uh, concept of space changes an entire function of offices and the relationship of the worker to the space around him. Next slide, please.
this becomes a uh, the, the latest and the most indeterminate of our shell structures. What I've been talking about so far has been really the exploitation of shell forms. Uh, for those of you who are unaware of, of, what, it, of what a shell is, uh, I, I would like to, to try to describe it simply. A shell is a form where the uh, it, it's a, a surface form, a form made of a surface where the surface carries both tension and compression. And it is the, so an egg, for example, is a shell, but a curtain wall building which has a frame, uh, this building, for example, is not a shell. Uh, it has a frame, it has a structural system around which a curtain or enclosure is placed. But this building is a shell form. This building, as you can see, the cells in the background uh, consists of a rather uh, uh, well-developed expression of the bedroom function. All the cells in the back are bedrooms. Uh, they were all defined for us by the government as being a maximum of 120 square feet. And then the problem became one of trying to see what you could do with 120 square feet. Uh, so we very simply uh, arranged all of the things on a floor pattern that you would like to see in a bedroom. Uh, if you were a, if you were indigent, uh, we arranged a bed, we arranged a dresser, we arranged uh, uh, closets, we arranged a little seat, and then we drew a line around it. And that line was not a square room. Uh, that line resembled much more an Indian hogan or the 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 requirements of, of of primitive man, where he laid out his requirements and he enclosed his requirements. And this, for us, became an elliptical form. Uh, which we were able to put together in this fashion. And it also became our structure. And these uh, strange uh, growths of space proceeding downward from it are likewise enclosures of space. They enclose uh, television sets and couches and kitchens and uh, uh, Martha Washington sewing cabinets. They, they enclose all of the simple good things of living but when you just start to enclose them, you discover that uh, the, the rectilinear enclosure is not, per se, a definition of heaven. Um, <laughs> there is something else in the world other than the right angle. And it took us all the Victorian period to get through it. Uh, Corbusier in 1925 said that the right angle was the uh, perfect form of in all the world, and yet when you stop to uh, think about it until somebody came along and invented the right angle, it never existed. Uh, it is a very artificial form. It has its function. We certainly know, but uh, there are other ways to exist and live happily in the world than with right angles. We're beginning to discover, rediscover some of them. Uh, <coughs> So in these lower spaces, you find uh, living rooms and kitchens and, and uh, porches. And uh, all of this outer space here is just a uh, great big uh, open gallery for kids to play in. And it has little secret places and uh, places that uh, uh, get larger and places that get smaller. And, and uh, it, it's, it's like living. Um, now this is meant to be low-cost housing. It's meant to be housing for the indigent. And I have been under very bitter criticism uh, by our uh, social forces, by our social thinkers, for designing both of these buildings, both the elderly, which I just showed you before, as well as this building, because they are too good for the poor. And uh, if I tell you that this is as simple as the criticism is, I mean it to be just that simple and that straightforward, and that is the basis for the criticism. The poor should not live this well. Uh, well, we are doing this for second generation poor. We are doing this for... <laughs> you know, for people who never will be anything but poor. And... Uh, 
this is what I mean when I say that an architect works within a society. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is the way in which we have put together these two buildings. It's a site plan. It's a site plan which you don't usually see. Uh, you usually see site plans laid out with these nice rectilinear blocks and they stretch out. If you come to Chicago, I invite you to go down State Street, 22nd Street South, to see what we think of people. Uh, you will find here, I would guess, uh, some 40 or 50,000 people uh, housed in a kind of cellular factory uh, system, factory system, uh, uh, which is meant to be a storage place for these people until they can die. And uh, I don't mean to be dramatic about this. Uh, this is a simple, straightforward appraisal of what we have as architects, as planners, as governmental people, as philosophers, said to ourselves. This statement exists in brick and concrete, and unfortunately, it will exist until that last amortized dollar uh, is paid off. And that will last about another 49 years. Uh, so roughly uh, three generations will have the privilege of seeing what our society had to say about uh, roughly one-third of our social system. Now in contrast to that, we have tried to compose a <coughs> site plan for our indigent which incorporates family living and elderly living, except that I don't know what elderly living is because I suspect I'm pretty close to being elderly living myself. Uh, it used to be that the elderly were uh, <coughs> somebody whom you put in the upstairs bedroom until they could uh, get out of your way. Uh, then finally the elderly became a kind of uh, people who uh, were deriving their income from our social security system past the age of 65. Now we have reduced the elderly down to the age of 62. Uh, now uh, we are embarking on the definition of elderly which says that the elderly are people who are beyond interest in family raising and the family raising pattern. So anybody who is beyond the interest in raising a family is an elderly. <laughs> 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 I was to accept that for my first child. <laughs> <laughs> At all events, we have the elderly here, and we have a social force where uh, my friend Ralph Helstein, who is head of the Packing House Workers Union, uh, says that we will have roughly 20 million unemployed in the United States in the year 1980. Now, that doesn't mean that they are unemployable. That means that they, there will be no jobs for them. And when I ask Ralph what he envisions for these people, he says, I envision the greatest life that civilization has ever produced. I envision a life of learning, of thinking, of talking, of civilization at its highest form. This is not a hopeless picture. And as architects creating for these people, we are not allowed to make it hopeless if indeed we have faith in ourselves. Uh, here we have housing for the elderly in these two buildings. We have housing for those uh, uh, young idealists who are still raising families back here. Uh, we have schools in those buildings for the very young so that they don't have the problem of traffic. We have an outdoor theater, uh, a kind of uh, forum, kind of Greek theater thing where the elderly can go and sit, read a newspaper, or play checkers, or play chess, or talk to each other, or have concerts, uh, or just sit in a winter sun protected from the wind. We have here a community building where they can 
uh, do all of the things which I am sure you have so well learned in your own community building, art and craft. And we have found that these poor elderly uh, really enjoy life. Uh, we aren't just sitting around as the government hauled me off to Washington to tell me, and I have been through this, so I'm speaking about this on a first-hand basis. They showed me pictures of the elderly in Texas, uh, people with <laughs> uh, field hands with uh, caps on inside of lobby, playing pool, uh, the women just sitting there with folded hands. Uh, and it looked like those horrible Victorian pictures of insane asylums where people just line the walls waiting to die. And this is the transition for which we are now designing. This is the transition uh, where we are attempting to garner for our society the, uh, the, the wisdom, the experience, uh, the uh, social force that will come from our elderly groups, where we will combine it with our family groups, and not isolate the elderly as if they were uh, some unwelcome portion of our society, but integrate this once again into a kind of uh, working group between old and young and evoke a picture of total society. Uh, again, in the juxtaposition of building you find something that worries the sanitary planners because it isn't laid out on the rectilinear basis that uh, form our city quadrants. Uh, this comes from a more vital type of uh, organization of mass and form that again is the byproduct of these new forms with which we find ourselves working. Next slide, please. Uh, this is still another shell form. It's a horizontal shell form. And this is a building which is meant to be an automobile building. Uh, the left-hand portion of this building is street, uh, penetrated to the outside. The right-hand side is building. It's rather continuous. It has no, no uh, columns in it. And I'll show you in a moment how we use it. Next slide, please. <coughs> this is a a uh, picture of our site plan in Detroit. And here we have, uh, it's a riverfront, and here we have three large towers, two of them used for apartment residential uh, use, and one used as a hotel uh, of a different form, modified. And here we take that great tube and we make a kind of turbo building. Uh, we just extrude this building in a rather continuous form, winding it around itself. Uh, we get a slope in our floors uh, which is less than the irregularities than we find ourselves experiencing, uh, experiencing in concrete structures of a perfectly normal variety. And uh, this is really quite useful. Uh, the, uh, this winds around. Uh, four times and then spins off in this fashion and becomes a kind of barrier. And we are able to <coughs> put many kinds of activities in here and use it in many ways. Uh, <coughs> again, I'm showing you this to show you that finally, as architects, we have come to a point where we can build almost anything we can imagine. And for the first time in the history of man, this has been true. Uh, what we do with it becomes our problem. Next slide. <coughs> Uh, this is a picture of the structure of Marina City. This is that center core, which uh, many of you did not get to see in its uh, construction period. Uh, you notice that uh, the door forms here are uh, much more those forms of a true shell. We don't use the uh, rectilinear type of opening, which of course comes from post and beam tradition, but we use the more fluid concepts of of the shell forms, crustacean forms. Next slide, please. Uh, here you see a very, what for me is a very pleasing contrast. There were these two buildings, the United Light Building in Chicago, going up in quite a traditional fashion. And here were our two cores going up 600 feet by themselves. It was uh, pleasing, but certainly frightening to me because I 
never knew whether two and two made four finally. Yes. Uh, you do all this engineering, but we are in areas of uh, construction where truly we don't know uh, whether we are right or wrong. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the outgrowth of non post and beam construction where our forms, which are uh, in 19th century parlance, pure functional forms, that is to say, the concrete at the extreme outside end of the balcony over there is reduced in thickness because that is the extreme end of our cantilever, where we come in here where our shear develops into our vertical forms, and we express this not in a formalism, not in the 19th century formalism of post and beam, but in the uh, true reflection of the way in which the stresses themselves flow from one area into another area. And suddenly we find that we have an aesthetic expression, a sculptural expression, which is uh, related to the form, but uh, uh, quite, uh, quite a satisfaction uh, of another order. It is, a, uh, it, it is an intuitive and uh, aesthetic uh, satisfaction of the highest <coughs> order. Next slide, please. <clears throat> these are all slides next slide please these are all slides which show architecture as sculpture suddenly uh, uh, all structural uh, all valid as structure uh, please just go through these uh, Service areas and these are the introspective areas. 
I will show you how these work in time. But you begin to evoke a new reaction to building around you when you see forms like this, which is not the blind curtain wall building that you see on Park Avenue. <coughs> This would be done in a concrete wall about 10 inches thick for the full 50 stories. And you can see the almost cathedral-like quality of the spaces that, that uh, are the base. These windows we actually have built in full-size mock-up to. Uh, we get into trouble with things like shades and curtains all the housekeeping problems, but we, we either say they aren't important or we sell them. rather tricky in itself, uh, it, it, uh, structurally speaking, and, and uh, uh, we have built on top of it. Here you can see the convoluted form of the concrete, which I showed to you earlier, and uh, uh, that expresses itself in the, in the uh, uh, floor plan all the way up. <coughs> this mass is actually what we call a tension mass. Column. We just finished building one on top of Marina City in Chicago that's 400 feet high. Now you can begin to see how these forms, we, we try to express these forms in the earth so that you can see that they uh, were not something that was just pasted on top of the earth, but they came out of a system. Here again you can see the convolution very clearly that form is structured. A building that is built this simply does not derive its elegance from bronze and stainless steel. Uh, it derives its elegance simply from, from the uh, form and the metal processes. Now here you begin to see how the offices lay out. We hired a firm, uh, a firm called Booz Allen and Hamilton, an office management people, to analyze these forms because they were so unusual. And we analyzed this in uh, contrast to the new CBS building in New York, which is built on a modular form of uh, five foot squares. Uh, we came out about seven or eight percent uh, more efficient uh, with these irregular forms, but all of them very closely related to a vertical pattern in the center. Now here you can see how this large introspective area is used as a conference room. We tried all various kinds of uses for the, uh, for the space to make sure that it could be properly used in uh, various uh, office applications. Now here you see it used in a typical uh, low type executive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, they, they get so many square feet per dollar and uh, this is the lowest man on the totem pole. Uh, they're, they're now divided into four spaces in that form. Uh, here the executive has become the uh, junior senior executive and he gets uh, half of the space in a little waiting room outside for his people. And he, he, each of them gets a window. <laughs> but this is all this is all a vocabulary which they uh, which they use. And here you find the top man on the totem pole, and he gets a total space. And uh, then the way in which his total space arranges itself, and uh, the various things that can do with it in total space is not a matter for analysis. Uh, also, his secretary gets his space all by herself. She goes right on up the ladder with her boss. <laughs> You can see in the center we have a system <coughs> of escalators uh, with express elevators stopping at every fourth floor and then the escalators operating as uh, local, uh, 
well for transportation. Now here uh, in the service area, I don't know if this will stop, stop. <laughs> no, it won't. Uh, but you can see that, uh, you can see how those office, how those service spaces are divided up into uh, into various types of offices for uh, five, six, and seven uh, workers. And here is the extreme case where uh, the managers, where they run out of managers and they have to put secretaries in those spaces and could be used for that. Uh, the advantage of this is simply that you get uh, spaces, you begin to see your space not as a fixed rectilinear form, uh, except for certain of the uh, smaller subdivisions, but space really is a growing thing. It's what we call kinetic space rather than static space. And we are exploring not only with uh, such simple people as the American Broadcasting Company in uh, <laughs> New York, but we are also exploring the effect of this space with uh, more complicated people such as the Menninger Foundation, where they have actually a, uh, a project to determine the effect of environment on the individual. And this is uh, developing into some extremely interesting things. Uh, I think that's enough of this movie. We've seen the building. Uh, could we have the uh, lights for a moment? I think that the architect today is designing really for a new society, for a new man and society. He is designing in his best form. He's no longer designing individual buildings, but rather environment. And I think by and large, he's designing them for a new type of men, men of faith. Uh, I hope I've made you understand how excited we are about our future. And when I say ours, I mean all of ours. And I hope, in a sense, I have made it possible for you to project your own activities and your own interests into what will become a new architectural center here in Indiana and for the country and for the world. I wish you every good with it. Thank you. confident that the applause uh, indicates to you better than I can uh, the reception that uh, this audience has given your remark. I don't know how you all felt, but I thought it was most appropriate for Mr. Goldberg to talk about the problems of man and mass society. And as we're becoming a little massier uh, than we were in the past, <laughs> uh, some of our problems uh, might be solved by architecture, sir. <laughs> uh, we are indeed indebted to you.